These video modules have been created at the Pacific Institute of Languages, Arts and Translation to help trainers and translators in the Pacific who want to learn more about their languages and linguistics. In this video, we will begin to look at the topic of morphology, how you can often cut up words into smaller parts, each with their own meanings. We will introduce the terms morphemes, prefixes, stems and suffixes. First, imagine a piece of bamboo. Although it is one piece of bamboo, it can be cut up into different sections. Words are often like this too. A single word can often be cut up into different parts and each part has its own meaning. Consider the word unlocked in English. This is one word describing what someone did to a door in the past. However, it is made up of three different parts that each have their own meaning. The main part of the word is lock in the middle. The un part of the word means something like do the opposite of. Notice that we have drawn a line called a hyphen to show this attaches to the front of the main part of the word. The ed part of the word tells us that the action happened in the past. Again, notice that we have written a hyphen to show that this comes after the main part of the word. These three parts of the word that have their own meanings are called morphemes. One word can be made up of several morphemes. Here, the word unlocked is made of three morphemes, un, lock and ed. Different types of morphemes have different names. Look at the example of walked. This one word contains two morphemes. The main part of the meaning of the whole word is walk, so this is called the stem. Sometimes it is also called the base or the root. This is a meaning you could look up in a dictionary. Linguists describe this by saying it has lexical meaning. The other morpheme in this word is ed. This comes after the stem, so it is called a suffix. Ed is not a morpheme you could look up in a dictionary. Linguists say it has grammatical meaning, telling us that something happened in the past. Linguists write grammatical meanings with capital letters, so they might write the meaning of this word like this, using a hyphen to show that these two morphemes make up one word, and the capital letters PST to show the meaning of the ed suffix. At other times, something is added at the start of the word. Here, the word unclear also has two morphemes. The main morpheme in the word is clear. Then, the morpheme un comes before the main part of the word, and so it is called a prefix. Now let's look at an example from a Pacific language. We'll use the example of Mata'am from the Awad Bing language, an Austronesian language spoken in Madang province. Mata'am is one word in Awad Bing, but the meaning in English is your eye. So we need to use two words in English to describe the meaning. This is because Mata'am in Awad Bing is one word that contains two morphemes. Let us separate the morphemes. In this word, the first morpheme is the stem Mata, meaning I. This is the same as many Austronesian languages. The second morpheme is a suffix Am, meaning the I belongs to you. Linguists write the meaning of this suffix with a hyphen and the capital letters 2SG.POS to show that this is a grammatical meaning, showing the I is owned, or possessed, by you, the second person singular. Now look at a more complicated example from the Kalo language, an Austronesian language from Central Province. If we translate the one word egitarato into English, we would say he saw them. We need to use three words in English because there are many morphemes inside this one Kalo word which cannot all be expressed in one word in English. Let's split the Kalo word into the different morphemes. First, we find the stem, gita, which is to do with seeing. Remember, this is the part with lexical meaning. We could look up gita in a Kalo dictionary. Before gita, we have the prefix e, which tells us who is doing the seeing. It is he or she. Linguistically, we say there is a third-person singular subject. After the stem, there are two suffixes in this example. The first suffix, ra, tells us what was seen. It was several things or people, them. Linguistically, we say there is a third-person plural object. 
Finally, the last suffix, to, tells us that this seeing happened in the past, not now. So we translate as he saw them rather than he sees them. Remember that linguists like to write these grammatical meanings with capital letters. Linguists would gloss this whole word like this to show the meaning of each morpheme separated by hyphens and telling us that a third-person singular subject saw several third-person plural objects in the past. We have looked at some examples of splitting words up into different morphemes. But how do you actually do it in your own language? Words with more than one morpheme occur in almost every language, but they can often be hard to recognize in your own language if you have never looked for them before. However, it is very useful to do this in order to explain the meaning of words in your language to someone else who does not speak it. One way to find morphemes is to look at lots of similar words and see if you can find parts that are repeated in several of the words, as in these verbs from Kahlo. Then you can draw lines between those parts of the words and try to describe what those parts tell you. For example, here we can see that several words end in the suffix to, and all those actions happened in the past, so we can draw a line before those letters. We might think the suffix was ato, but that doesn't work for the last example. Then we can also see many words that begin with a, a, or o, for things that are done by him, me, or you, respectively, so we can draw a line after those letters. Now we can more clearly see some stems and draw lines at the beginning and ending of each one, like Gita, Kilagi, Laka, and Rani. Now we can work out the meanings of some of the different morphemes. We can see that Gita is a stem to do with seeing, Kilagi is a stem to do with saying, Laka is a stem to do with going, and Rani is a stem to do with eating. Prefixes tell us who did the action. A is a morpheme saying that I did it. O is a morpheme saying that you did it. A is a morpheme saying that he or she did it. And ge is a morpheme saying that they did it. Then, suffix morphemes at the end tell us when something is or was happening. To is a morpheme telling us that the event happened in the past. Na is a morpheme telling us the event is happening now, and Y is a morpheme telling us the event was continuing to happen in the past. That just leaves us with the suffixes ra and a. Look at the English translations and you can see that these tell you about the object of the sentence. A is used when people see or say one thing, it, and ra is used when people see or say more than one thing, them. Take some time to think about your own language and how you can split words up into different morphemes. Let's review the concepts in this lesson. Words can often be broken up into different morphemes. The main morpheme with a lexical meaning is called the stem, or base, or root. Morphemes coming before the stem are called prefixes. Morphemes coming after the stem are called suffixes. Sometimes prefixes and suffixes together are called affixes. Finally, a translation tip. When you are translating, remember that several words in English might only be translated by one word in your language with several morphemes in it. For example, he saw them is three words in English, but just one word in Kahlo with four morphemes, e guitarato. If you translate every word in English with a separate word in your language, it may sound very unnatural. We need to make sure the right meaning is there for the words in English, but some of those meanings might be in different morphemes within one word in your language.